for the introducing me and uh, we'll talk about chronic infections uh, and how infections are connected to autoimmune diseases. Uh, and this topic is getting a bit more and more accepted by mainstream medical community, however it's still not very well accepted and uh, I'll try to explain why. I'll try to explain why there's some dogma about chronic infections both from diagnostic and therapeutic standpoint and so at the end you'll need to make your own choice. So uh, the talk will be divided into parts. Uh, during the first part we'll talk about principles of diagnosis and it'll be a little bit more basic uh, because I'll present some basic science and I'll explain where all these dogma are coming from and the second portion will be based on principles of therapies. Again, I will not go into details, but I'll present some basic principles and then you can customize those principles in your practice. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about prevalence of autoimmune diseases in the United States. And you can find different data depending on publications. So, uh, definitely without any exceptions, uh, the most prevalent autoimmune disease is a cluster of autoimmune thyroid diseases which incorporate Hashimoto disease and Graves disease and uh, various variants uh, between Hashimoto and Graves. Uh, based on uh, our estimation, based on uh, published data, the second disease which is also very prevalent is a cluster of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. However, depending on different publications, you know, some people feel that you know, the second place is occupied by rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, fibromyalgia, which is a cluster of probably 10 to 20 different diseases, Sjogren syndrome, celiac disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, colitis, lupus. You can see that uh, all these numbers count in millions and millions of patients. Uh, and then chronic fatigue syndrome and ankylosing spondylitis, among others. And again, the list can be continued and continued. Again, uh, this is official statistics, but the question is how many cases are around which don't have the label, who have definitely autoimmune disease, but no one has been able to diagnose them. So probably the rough estimation uh, 2.5 2, 2 times higher than the official statistics. Uh, again, uh, this is a slide which I compiled from another publication. So they're talking about prevalence of selected diseases. And so uh, the slide probably has not the best quality, but you can see that uh, the dominant one is rheumatoid arthritis. And again, uh, that's another uh, slide which talks about uh, chronic autoimmune diseases and uh, risk for these diseases. As you can see, the risk is much, much higher in women than in men. And again, uh, they're talking about like rheumatoid arthritis being number one. Again, based on my estimation, uh, it is uh, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. They don't talk about uh, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, which affects approximately close to maybe 5 or 10% of the population. Uh, giant cell arthritis, lupus, Sjogren syndrome, again, psoriatic arthritis, pretty low, and ankylosing spondylitis. And again, uh, this is estimated risk of the diseases. So uh, this is a typical model of autoimmune disease explaining why we're getting those diseases. And as Dr. Cunningham mentioned, so there are two main components. One component is uh, Hus constitution and genetics, and second component is environment. So, and these components communicate with each other through mainly gut, and to a lesser degree through nervous system, uh, lungs, and skin. Right? So when we're talking about environment, what is environment? So number one is infection. Uh, this is absolute uh, uh, true uh, uh, statement, and infections definitely probably the prevalent environment component triggering various autoimmune diseases. What else? Well, quite a few other things. So like heavy metals, uh, pesticides, uh, radiation, uh, UV lights, even uh, stressful factors uh, affecting our nervous system. So, but again, if you look at the global picture, the infections probably will occupy the majority of what we mean when we talk about environment. So, uh, the notion about infection as a driving force behind autoimmune diseases basically goes back to two or three hundred years ago, but only in the 80s and 90s uh, that whole idea was more or less well scientifically formulated. And actually, uh, the proof of the theory came from uh, animal experiments. So in the 90s, when a lot of genetic technique became available, so 
people start developing uh, transgenic mice. And so they were transferring genes which are responsible for various autoimmune diseases into animals and trying to see uh, what kind of diseases these animals uh, will develop. So the classical model, obviously, it's a model of ankylosing spondylitis in HLA-B27 transgenic mice. Uh, this model was well characterized, and so if you develop uh, transgenic mice with HLA-B27 positive gene, so these mice eventually develop ankylosing spondylitis-like illness, colitis, uveitis, uh, and uh, sometimes a cluster of various uh, problems which we now refer as spondyloarthropathies. Around the same time, a new technique became available, uh, which is uh, development of germ-free mice or germ-free animals. And the whole science right now, it's called gnota biology. So it's a science about germ-free animals. What's been exciting is that if you put all these transgenic animals into germ-free or gnotobiotic environment, they don't develop autoimmune diseases. And actually, it was a great excitement at the time. It proved the point that uh, microorganisms, not only uh, bacteria, but also viruses, can contribute to the development of autoimmune diseases. So this is uh, a very hard scientific proof that uh, viruses and um, bacteria are part of our environment, which contributes to the development of chronic inflammatory conditions and autoimmune disease as well. Uh, the second cluster, which we're not going to talk about, is food, because what's been shown, for example, that uh, like lupus prone mice, uh, which are fed with gluten, uh, develop lupus. And if you eliminate gluten from their diet, they don't develop lupus. And it was another confirmation that uh, food is another environmental factor uh, participating in the development of autoimmune disease. This is probably second after the infectious component. So uh, let's talk about chronic infections. So why this is a so controversial topic, why uh, the mainstream medical community is still in denial that chronic infections do exist, and what's bad about this. So uh, first of all, there are some legal issues. Uh, the number of infections required to be reported to state health departments is very limited. Uh, and uh, so mainly it is uh, limited to infections uh, which potentially can cause serious epidemic situations such as HIV, such as TB, uh, such as shigellosis Shigel and salmonellosis and lately Lyme disease. Uh, so, but the rest of the infections, for example, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, even chlamydia trachomatis uh, by definition is not reported to the states. So we don't really know what's the uh, prevalence of these uh, chronic infections in the community. So the second is that uh, most of the time the system is very outdated and based mainly on uh, positive cultures and positive PCR and as we know in patients with chronic infections uh, both tests are not very reliable and uh, they can miss probably up to 80% of all the cases. Uh, uh, so, uh, the major as I said, majority of chronic infections causing autoimmune diseases are not reportable by law. And again, the true prevalence of chronic infections in the community is unknown. Even, let's say, uh, strep infection, uh, the infection which can cause rheumatic fever, uh, panda syndrome, and so on and so on, we don't really know what's the prevalence. And I can give an example. Uh, so, uh, every year in our clinic we have uh, two or three new patients with rheumatic fever which are misdiagnosed by mainstream rheumatology because they've never seen rheumatic fever. We have two or three new cases of panda syndrome every year, and these are not pediatric. We're talking about adult panda syndrome, which actually presented to emergency room with uh, psychotic episodes and basically considered as drug addicts using synthetic drugs, which cannot be detected in the blood. So it's a real life. So uh, I want to use Lyme as a typical example because uh, there's a splash of activity around Lyme disease these days. And I can show you the discrepancy bef between official statistics and what's happening. So uh, these are publicly available uh, maps which you can find uh, under the California State Health Department. So the map on the left uh, shows uh, actually prevalence of deer ticks uh, in the state of California. So you can see that almost all counties in California have deer ticks, uh, with no exceptions. And uh, the bar, uh, the red stuff, a uh, red color right here, so uh, it's a prevalence of the states where uh, deer ticks are infected with Borrelia. Uh, 
So, and still, uh, if you talk to the mainstream physician, uh, Lyme disease doesn't exist in California. The question is why? There's no explanation. So, uh, the second map is actually shows you the prevalence of, of Lyme disease, uh, which is based on uh, CDC criteria for Lyme disease in California. So, uh, and you can see that there's a discrepancy between the prevalence of ticks infected with Borrelia and prevalence of uh, Lyme disease. So there was a cluster of Lyme patients around Bay Area, and actually the second cluster is uh, between uh, Orange County and San Diego right here, right? So why, do we have different ticks? No, so around uh, uh, Bay Area, there are probably around 10 or 15 physicians who take care of Lyme patients, and so they report to state health department that they have new Lyme patients, and the same thing is happening uh, around San Diego and Orange County. So it's a very, very subjective, but it reflects the whole situation. So what happened in between, so between Bay Area and San Diego, probably majority of Lyme patients, they have different labels, so they diagnose patients who have chronic syndrome, chronic, fat chronic uh, fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on and so on, without even thinking that these are the patients who can be treated in a completely different way. And so this is an old map uh, which uh, I downloaded from the same kind of State Department showing same thing, prevalence of actually ticks uh, bearing uh, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and prevalence of uh, Lyme disease. Again, very similar situation. So this is just an example uh, how uh, public uh, feels about you know, the conditions and uh, how easy to misinterpret the actual data. So uh, let's talk about chronic infections, a little bit about basic signs. So why infections can persist in the heart? So what is the basic signs? So uh, first of all, there are quite a few microorganisms such as uh, mycoplasma, various species of mycoplasma, various species of chlamydia, and various species of Bartonella, uh, which lives inside of the cell. So these are so-called intracellular parasites or intracellular microorganisms. So, and uh, these microorganisms, they basically, uh, in most of the situations, not very uh, kind of prone to uh, detection by our immune system. So uh, they basically escape from immune surveillance and our immune system cannot recognize them as uh, infections unless they go into a kind of acute phase and pop up on the surface of the cells. Uh, molecular mimicry, uh, that's the whole area where Dr. Cunningham is a world expert. Uh, it's basically mimicry between uh, antigens of microorganisms and host antigens. And again, quite frequently, uh, our immune system cannot recognize uh, these antigens because uh, it views them as self-antigens. Uh, the next mechanism based on protective code. So uh, microorganisms are smart, and so they have receptors which attract our own proteins, and so they create like protective coat. And so, again, just to show a few of them, it's FC receptors, albumin receptors, fibrinogen receptors, and so on and so on. So uh, once uh, our body is invaded by these microorganisms, they create protective coat, and again, our immune system uh, does not recognize them as foreign bodies. Uh, the next <coughs> mechanism is uh, so-called persistent of infection in barrier organs or tissues, for example, brain or eyes, where our immune system is not allowed to be. And again, uh, it's a very well described, you know, mechanism of survival of uh, chronic infections, cr chronic infection agents. Uh, so the next uh, thing, which was very popular in the 70s and 80s, and now kind of the interests uh, a little bit kind of not there. It's a formation of uh, low immunogenic L forms, and actually there are uh, tons of data about uh, streptococcal infection persisting in uh, L forms, and L forms, for example, in case of strep, are resistant to penicillin. And so, uh, again, uh, these forms uh, can survive for years and years and years, and uh, there was a famous researcher in streptococcal area, Dr. Lansfield, who showed that persistence of L form can be absorbed up to 25 or 30 years in certain patients. And again, these L forms can be transformed in normal forms and, and then become pathogenic. So uh, the next uh, mechanism is uh, immunosuppression. So uh, again, uh, microorganisms are smart. Uh, 
uh, they can produce various biologically active substances which can inhibit dendritic cells, they can suppress antibody formation, uh, they can actually inhibit interferon formation, and they can inactivate complement, and so on and so on. Uh, and so it makes our immune system is not very efficient. And finally, but uh, not the least, basically, not, uh, it's uh, biofilm formation. So biofilm formation actually is like protective shield, which protects clusters of microorganisms from uh, immune attacks, and so it allows microorganisms to survive for years and years and years. So uh, that's kind of the basic science. So uh, now let's talk about controversies. So why uh, mainstream medical community is so stubborn and so resistant uh, in recognizing of chronic infections. And uh, let's talk about uh, history because without the history it would be difficult to understand. So uh, in the beginning of infectious diseases, uh, there were a group of very prominent physicians, mainly in Germany and Austria. Uh, one of them was Robert Koch, uh, who uh, actually got Nobel Prize, and the second was Friedrich Loeffler. Uh, they were extremely uh, advanced at their age, and so they established the foundation of infectious diseases. And uh, at the end of 19th century, they proposed so-called Cox postulates, or Cox criteria, which basically exist in unchanged form now. So these criteria are outdated. Uh, they are probably can be used in acute infections, but by no means during the chronic infections. But uh, it's a whole, uh, probably many, many generations of physicians uh, they've been trained in medicine uh, and specifically in fact disease utilizing those criteria. And when you go to real world and study with chronic infections, you realize that, you know, something doesn't work. So what are these criteria? So the first one is that the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but should not be found in healthy organisms. And again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So the second uh, Cox postulate, a Cox principle, was that uh, the microorganism must be isolated from a diseased organism and grown in pure culture. Uh, the uh, postulate number three tells you that the cultured microorganism should cause disease when introduced into healthy organism. And the final uh, postulate number four is uh, that the microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated disease experimental host and identified as being identical to the original specific uh, agent. And again, uh, these are the postulates were extremely progressive 100 years ago, but they create kind of major historical burden on the whole infectious diseases now. So why these postulates are not applicable to chronic infections? Uh, first of all, chronic infections are uh, characterized by the presence of uh, exacerbation remissions. And again, both exacerbations uh, caused by the same microorganism. So it's not like a one-time event. Uh, so typically, uh, the agent which was growing infection present in the host during the entire time independently from the symptoms. So you may have a person in remission, let's say Lyme disease, and the person carry uh, Borrelia all the time. The same is true for TB, the same is true for number of microorganisms. So, and again, this is completely different from the Cox postulate. So uh, next one is that now with advance of uh, genetics, we know that microorganisms and viruses causing chronic infection in susceptible individuals can be present and isolated from completely asymptomatic humans, so-called healthy carriers. And that's a known truth. But again, this goes absolutely against Cox postulates. And what are the examples? Like group A strep. So there are people who carry strep. They're completely symptom-free. They don't have any symptoms. Mycoplasma pneumonia, like 5% of human beings carry mycoplasma with no any symptoms. EBV, uh, uh, the percentage of Epstein-Barr virus in adult population is close to 99.3%. HHV6, uh, corpus simplest type 1, and so on and so on. So again, what's happening? You have the bug, you don't have any symptoms, so it doesn't fit to the theory, right? So uh, the next thing is, uh, so microorganisms or viruses causing chronic infections in susceptible individuals do not cause any clinical ailments uh, in genetically resistant individuals. And so it's been shown in animals. It, it is very well uh, actually uh, shown in humans. So there are always people who are resistant no matter what. Again, it goes against the postulate. And also uh, another thing which we don't want to talk about is that when we're dealing with chronic infections, 
and this is not 100% truth, but it's applicable to probably majority of chronic infections. Uh, we're dealing with microorganisms which are very slowly proliferating, they slow grow. They don't have cell forms such as, for example, uh, L forms or mycoplasma or chlamydia. Uh, we're dealing with viruses, and so uh, in most of the instances of chronic infections, isolation of these agents uh, represent practically impossible uh, task, with few exceptions. So that's the first cluster. The second cluster is based on uh, how do we utilize serology. And again, uh, this is another historical burden because all our clinical immunology right now is based on vaccine immunology, not on infectious immunology. And it creates a big problem because most of the physicians who are trained in traditional medicine, you know, they look at patients with infections as if they were immunized with vaccine, and that's completely wrong. So what's the difference? So when uh, you're dealing with vaccination, so you introduce microbial antigens, not the whole cluster, but typically selected anti antigens in a very timely fashion. So this is completely different from infectious immunology because uh, you have uh, the release of uh, microbial and viral antigens uh, in completely timely, independent fashion, and there are so many different factors affecting it. It's like use of antibiotics, activity of natural killer cells, activity of complements, and so on and so on. So it's not like one-time deal. It's more or less continuous pro process with ups and downs. And so it affects, actually, uh, the interpretation of uh, your immunology test quite a bit. So uh, the second thing is the antigens uh, in the form of vaccines typically injected with adjuvants. And so what are the adjuvants? So basically these are uh, you know, chemicals which keep antigens in the body for a long, long time and they slowly release those antigens. So you do it on purpose because you want to create a sustainable immune response against certain molecules. This is completely uh, different compared to infections. So. Uh, First of all, in the absence of immunosuppressive therapy, the antibody titers in general uh, are proportional to the uh, amount and quality of release antigens. Uh, and again, uh, you can see ups and downs depending on a number of things. So uh, the final thing which I want to bring, and there are more and more which we can discuss, but I'm just pointing the main things is, so it's a whole notion about primary and secondary immune responses. So uh, when we're dealing with vaccines, so we're inducing specifically secondary immune responses, which are uh, basically based on high affinity antibodies. These antibodies protect our body from intruders. <clears throat> and uh, this is the whole goal of uh, uh, vaccine uh, vaccination or vaccine immunology. So uh, when, uh, and again, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So when you're dealing with infection, you know, you're dealing with very broad gamut of antibodies, including IgM and IgG and IgA. So, and the prevalence of specific IgM or IgG or IgJ antibodies has nothing to do with primary or secondary immune response. It's basically, it's a very complex issue. And when you see IgM, uh, you cannot tell that this is an acute infection. It just doesn't work this way. So, and uh, you can see spikes of IgM during the therapy. So you can see absence of IgM, you can see spikes of IgA. So it's a completely random process. You need to understand infectious immunology to make sense out of it. But again, you cannot transfer specifically vaccine immunology into infectious to make interpretation. And it creates a problem. So uh, again, this is a typical example of uh, primary and secondary immune response. So when you introduce a foreign antigen in the form of vaccine, so you create, you select clones which are producing high affinity antibodies, and these are typically IgG. And so you do booster injection specifically for the same reason, to induce high affinity antibodies which protect you from mainly toxins. So, but remember that, you know, in real life it doesn't work this way. So first of all, and there, are, uh, there are antigens which are T-cell dependent, and T-cell independent. So, and if you start utilizing T-cell independent antigen uh, as a diagnostic tool, you're never gonna get uh, IgG because uh, basically when you immunize animals with T-cell independent antigens, so you're gonna get only IgM response. So uh, can you rely on that? Yes, absolutely, you can rely on that and you can actually measure the level of IgM antibodies uh, as a diagnostic marker. So second, again, in real life, so if you're dealing with uh, T-cell-dependent antigens, so you have both IgM and IgG, and again, uh, the time 
frame of the release depends on release of appropriate antigens. And so, for example, in patients with Lyme disease, you can see initial spike of IgM. You treat those patients, they go in remission, and then they have a flare-up, and you have IgM again. So how it can be evolved? Because you have a new uh, influx of antigens uh, triggering all these responses. But again, it goes again ag against uh, all the dogma of vaccine immunology and creates confusion. So, uh, and uh, let's talk briefly about chronic infections and autoimmune diseases. So uh, how, what's the connection? So that's probably the most important things. How chronic infections can induce autoimmune diseases? Well, the, probably the most well-recognized mechanism, and that's what Dr. Cunningham was talking about, is molecular mimicry. So basically, we have pathogens uh, which carry uh, peptides, carbohydrates, uh, lipids, phospholipids, and so on and so on, uh, which kind of similar to a certain degree uh, to self-antigens. And uh, chronic overstimulation of our immune system with these cross-reactive antigens eventually uh, can result in break of the uh, self-tolerance and uh, basically induce uh, auto-reactive T-cell clones, auto-antibodies, and so on and so on, and eventually result in uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, so the next mechanism uh, based on so-called cryptic antigens, so these are antigens which in real life are hidden deep in the cells, they're not uh, available for immune recognition, and <clears throat> different processes can result in uh, appearance of these cryptic antigens uh, on the surface of the cells, so these antigens, uh, they become immunogenic, and uh, our bodies are making various kind of immune responses against those cryptic antigens, and as a consequence, we're developing autoimmune illness. So uh, it's been described well uh, in animals, it's been shown uh, in humans under certain circumstances. So, uh, and again, that's a very valid and very important mechanism of uh, linking autoimmune diseases and chronic infections. So the next mechanism uh, based on uh, super antigens. Uh, so uh, super antigens are uh, basically products of uh, microbial environment metabolism. Uh, they found in bacteria and in mycoplasma uh, and found in virus infected cells. So uh, they bind uh, T cell res receptors or TCR uh, irrespective of its antigenic specificity. So basically what you have, you have an enormous uh, activation of T cells, and some of these uh, cells can be uh, autoreactive T cells, and there's a clonal selection, and at the end, uh, you may end up with autoimmune diseases basis, uh, basically based on these super antigens. So again, uh, this mechanism takes place definitely in patients who have mycoplasma infection, uh, it's been described in patients with uh, streptococcal infection, uh, chlamydia trachomatis, and chlamydia pneumonia, as well as Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, so the next mechanism is based on so-called bystander uh, activation. So uh, it's basically something which uh, Dr. Cunningham described as uh, epitope spread. So uh, it's expansion of clones which start reacting not only to one antigen but multiple antigens and eventually uh, can result in production of uh, autoreactive clones of both T cells and B cells and manifest in the uh, form of uh, various uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the leading mechanisms which uh, results in uh, chronic, uh, really resistant autoimmune diseases, resistant to uh, antimicrobial therapy or when to step in with much, much heavier therapy such as biologics, disease-modifying drugs and steroids, and sometimes chemotherapy. So it's a bystander activation. Uh, and a uh, couple of uh, things uh, about latent infections. So uh, that's something which is uh, mainly related to viruses and Epstein-Barr EBV is uh, a typical example of that. So uh, we, as adults, we all carry various latent infections such as uh, varicella zoster, EBV, HSV6, CMV, HSV1, HSV2, and so on and so on. So uh, uh, under normal circumstances, so these viruses uh, are dormant and uh, they don't uh, activate uh, antigen-presenting cells at all. So, uh, but uh, upon activation, for example, it's been shown in case of Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, uh, 
So uh, there is a polyclonal activation uh, of B cells, antigen presenting cells, and uh, basically there is a, a activation of TH1 uh, responses and uh, corresponding clones and all this stuff can lead to autoimmune diseases and actually this mechanism was described in patients with uh, lupus and Sjogren syndrome and right now there is a cluster of publications focused on EBV as a, one of the leading causes of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's and lupus. So uh, probably more than 100 articles, very well documented. So uh, a couple of things uh, which I decided to present mainly because of the new drugs. So TH17 response is a key regulator of antimicrobial responses in autoimmunity. And so TH17 cells basically they secrete uh, IL-17. And so last week Novartis actually uh, announced that FDA approved a new biologic agent uh, which will be neutralizing uh, interleukin-17. And so uh, this was approved for patients with ankylosing spondylitis and uh, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of benefits uh, uh, we can gain. But again, that's a product which will deeply affect uh, autoimmune responses and responses against microbial cells for a number of reasons. So uh, a couple of things about trendy things. So right now it's very trendy to diagnose patients with mast cell activation syndrome. So every week we have two or three patients who come by referrals who have mast cell activation syndrome. And so uh, basically mast cells are cells uh, which are found uh, on the borders between environment uh, and tissues. Uh, so uh, they detected in large quantities in uh, intestinal lining and in the skin. So uh, mast cell activation results in release of biologically active amines and other such as histamine, for example, or tryptase and other uh, substances, uh, which eventually can result in activation of tumor necrosis alpha, IL-1, beta, and various cytokines, uh, causing an autoimmune reaction. And so uh, the, in experimental uh, medicine, uh, there are quite a few publications showing how uh, mast cell activation can result and support the progression of encephalitis, which is right here, uh, uh, BP is uh, both pemphigus, uh, which is autoimmune skin disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. Again, in my view, that's not the main cause, but again, uh, muscle activation most likely contributes to chronicity of these illnesses. And again, I decided because it's a hot topic now, I decided to put some symptoms because again, patients with muscle activation come to our clinic weekly, you know, with various complaints. So how do you recognize uh, uh, those symptoms? So it's a urticaria, uh, angioedema, flashing, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping. Uh, quite a few of these patients, they have so-called PATH syndrome. Uh, also tachycardia, wheezing, uh, uh, pruritus, nasal congestion, so on and so on. And so these are the patients who respond to uh, histamine uh, receptor blockade. Uh, and mast cell activate stabilizers. So uh, in our clinic, uh, we came up uh, with uh, our own criteria how to diagnose uh, chronic infections because, again, we're dealing, it, we're rheumatologists, we're dealing with autoimmune disease all the time. And so the question is, uh, who among our patients do have and don't have uh, infections. So we came up with our criteria, we, which I'm gonna share with you. Uh, so first of all, uh, the suspected individuals should have symptoms compatible with chronic infections, and I'll show you on the next slide what these symptoms are. So uh, the cornerstones of our diagnostic approach is based on correlation between clinical symptoms and specific serologic and molecular uh, or microbiologic findings, so like findings of antibodies. Uh, and again, uh, it depends on your experience, but once you start putting together two things, you can create a clear-cut picture very easily. Uh, the next criteria is uh, dynamic changes uh, in serologic profile or profiles, uh, which can relate with changes in clinical symptoms upon administration of specific antimicrobial or antiviral therapy. So let's say you have a person with uh, EBV, and that person has chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, 
So you treat that, and you presume that there is a connection between EBV reactivation and the symptoms. So what would like you to see in uh, clinical practice? Well, you start these patients on aggressive antiviral therapy using both drugs and supplements, and so you can see the drop uh, in the specific antibodies, and uh, quite frequently you can see the correlation between resolution of chronic fatigue. It takes time, but you do see these correlations in practice. And it's just an example. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we came up uh, based on our own data, based on published data on uh, criteria for activity of chronic infections. Because again, when you're dealing with chronic infections, remember, there's a phase of activation, phase of dormancy. So how do you know that a uh, given individual has activity? So we'll share some of these criteria. So what are the clinical symptoms which we take into consideration? So it's a low-grade fever. Uh, although a lot of autoimmune diseases manifest in the form of low-grade fever, typically, typically low-grade fever is indicative for ongoing infections. Uh, night sweats, brain fog, uh, joint pain, which is migrate from one joint to another, so-called uh, migratory joint pain, uh, chronic cough. A lot of patients have asthma in reality. They have chronic mycoplasma chlamydia infection, and they don't really realize that that's a problem with their cough, and they're diagnosed with resistant asthma. Uh, tingling and numbness of hands and feet, which is a different from permanent damage, so it kind of comes and goes. Uh, 